Paul is talking about here. So Paul is now talking about, let me read for you the verse, and was declared to be the son of God in the power, verse four, to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. Verse six, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. This is something that I kind of did not really understand. So I had to kind of go back and to see what exactly does Paul talk here? What exactly is Paul conveying to us when it means to be like including you? What, is, what does including you mean? Who, who does he talk about? Who are called to belong to Jesus Christ? So that's when I kind of just wanted to see if what is this book all about? You, does it mean Jews? Does it mean Gentiles? So I felt it is good to kind of really go back a little bit at a higher altitude to see the overall summary of the book of Romans. Or probably we can call it the blueprint of Romans. To me, for a couple of years before, Romans was a very a dry book. A book actually that was that was more about a, a, a depth of, you know, and so much of uh, depth of gospel in it. And it was not so easy to be read, unlike how we read the book of gospels. The book of Romans was very, like, you know, we kind of tried to skip it. I tried to do that. I tried to do that, skipping Romans, because it was a very tough book. And today, like, I, I, when I kind of looked at this book, I felt like I need to go back to have a better understanding on the book of Romans. And as we meditate on this book, this entire 40 days, I felt it was going to be useful for us also. Like how I, I mean, I'm going to be, I was blessed by that and I felt, I feel that you would also be blessed by uh, going a little uh, broader from what the book means to us. Before we just move into the book, shall we bow down and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, your servant, Paul, had written to the people, the church in Rome. And I feel, Lord, that this was a wonderful book which has the crux of the entire gospel in it. Help us as we kind of look into the various aspects of the book. I pray that, Lord, that you would just bind our hearts together and help us to understand your word and today, what you want us to listen from you, help us to apply it in our lives so that we will live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. Pray, the, pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name, amen. So Paul wrote this book to the church in Romans. So to just give you a background, he sets forth a foundation on Christian faith. He sets a foundation on Christian faith. Shall we go to the next slide? So what to believe? Paul summarizes everything in a nutshell in the book of Romans. The number one thing is, just before, all people are sinful. He talks about this topic of all people are being sinful. The next one is Christ died to forgive sin. He brings in the concept of like how man is so sinful, how everyone in this world has been caught up in sin, and he also brings the concept of how Christ died to forgive sin. Going on, he also kind of takes us to the next uh, concept, concept of we are made right with God through faith. Paul clearly talks about here the, the, the journey of faith. Journey of faith in this particular book. He talks, starts with that how people are so sinful and how Christ died for the sinful people and how the people have been made right in the sight of God. And the, and the last one is, begins a new life with a new relationship with God. He not, not only talks about the what of of the book, he also sees like, how, he also says how to kind of 
take this journey? How do you kind of take this journey of this particular book? He also gives a practical guidance. He gives a practical guidance to the, book, to the people of Romans. And he talks about the gospel. Because if you look at Romans, if I have to bring everything under in one word, it would be the gospel. Paul tries to bring in the entire gospel into, into the book of Rome, Romans. He talks about how gospel is not just merely knowing what God had did. It's also to kind of helps in transforming the lives and impacts our lives on a daily basis. Paul really talks about this. This is the main foundation. So I felt it is good for us to have this understanding. And, and as we, as we, if we read Romans carefully, I can assure you that if we read Romans carefully, I can assure you that we will never be at a loss to know what to believe. You know, we will never be at a loss to know what to believe. And you see on the screen that, like, you know, this is the nutshell, this is a summary of the book of Romans. And of course, there's a lot of uh, in-depth things that Paul talks to the church in Romans. Let me just take a little deviation here. Martin Luther, you know, said that the book of Romans, how the book has been so helpful to the theologians, early theologians. Martin Luther said that the book of Romans was the most important book in the New Testament. And its central premise, the crucial part, what it is? It is the justification by faith alone. If you have to kind of ask, what is the centrality? It's justification by faith alone. He said like that was the doctrine on which the church was found. Martin Luther, you know, he was such a wonderful, and he loved this book, justification by faith alone. And that is from the book of Romans. He kind of, he drew all that. And this book also, you know, not only with Martin Luther, he, it actually kind of launches the Protestant Reformation in 16th century. And, and, you know, including John Calvin. Shall we go to the next slide? There are a few more people who are blessed, who had a great awakening from the book of Romans. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Jonathan Edward, John Wesley. All of these people had a great awakening from the book of Romans. If they can do that, I'm, I'm sure we also will be completely blessed and totally blessed by uh, going through this book. So this book has assured us into an era of modern missions. It answers the question of why the gospel and the gospel alone is the answer to the humanity's problem. He clearly kind of brings down a particular problem and Paul tries to address that problem right from the beginning. And that's what is our topic today. And, and I'm going to be doing that in another few minutes. But he tries to understand, he tries to take the gospel, that the gospel is the only answer for the humanity's problem. And he shows that the gospel, implication of the gospel has, has proven positive in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. And he says the book of Romans is the most clearest an in-depth book of gospel in all the scripture. Can you believe that? The book of Romans is the most in-depth book of the gospel, you know, compared to the all scripture. The book is not just written to explain the gospel to the unbelievers, but it's very clearly it says that it is written to the believers in Rome. It is not a gospel that has to be said to somebody who is not who does not know about Christ or Jesus, it is very clearly written to those who have been able to understand who Christ is. To give you another, um, you know, another background, Paul never traveled to Rome, or neither did you know, uh, the leaders like Peter or James. They never traveled to Rome, but they did encounter a few people. Like you know, if you look at um, Acts chapter 2, verse 10, it says, the believers who established the Roman church, you know, had been in Jerusalem. You know what? When? It was at the time of the Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. They traveled, they came back to, to uh, Jerusalem, and that is where they were waiting 
for the Holy Spirit to come on them. And there were also other few people like travelers, Aquila and Priscilla, who heard the good news and brought it back to Rome. And as you see, like, you know, the previous slide, the Rome was such a, a magnificent, you know, structure. Even today you have this same uh, structure there. It's one of the places people never miss to visit. It was a place of pride. It was a place of power. Rome was a place of military, you know, uh, uh, people. Powerful military and had a lot of political missionary. Massive buildings. They had their pride in that. They had their power in that. Of how, of how, however, Paul in the book of Romans talks about a different kind of a power and which is completely new to Rome, the people in Rome. Paul talks to the Roman church that it's only a deeper relationship with Jesus that you can gain more power to be, live a victorious life. He talks about a power that, that God alone can bring in, a power of salvation, a power of salvation, a power to forgive sin, a power to heal sickness, a power that can actually help us in a deeper relationship in Christ. Gospel, again I'm coming back to the gospel, Martin Luther, I, I again kind of quote Martin Luther because, because he was inspired completely from the book of Romans. He gives an example of the gospel, he says that gospel is like the well, you know, the well. You get to get the best water, do you know how? Not by widening the well, but by deepening the well. You get the best water, not by widening the well, but by deepening the well. And Martin Luther quotes that, or he compares the well to the gospel. And he says that, in the book of Romans, I see the depth of gospel in the book of Romans. And the original church in Roman, it actually predominantly, let me just tell you this illustration, a story, what happened in Rome, so that we kind of understand today's topic. The original church consisted of both Jews and the Gentiles. The Roman churches had both Jews and the Gentiles. And what happened, you know, predominantly, or predominantly the Jews always held the leadership positions in the church, in Rome. Jews were the ones who were holding the position of leadership in the church. So which means that the, 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 the church was full of Jewish Jewish tradition, Jewish customs, Jewish way of worship, Jewish way of music. Everything was more about the Jewish. Though it was like, you know, a mix of both Gentiles and Jews, predominantly the Jews held the position there. But Emperor Claudius, Emperor Claudius ordered all the Jews to get out of Rome. And we see that in Acts chapter eight, 18 verse 2. You know, Acts chapter 18, verse 2, he talks, uh, Emperor Claudius, you know, sends the Jews, not only the normal Jews, Jews who are also Christians, out of Rome. And then, they, you know, that's when, like, you know, they come out of Rome. And it's been almost, they are out of Rome for about five years. And that's when Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla also, you know, come out at, during that time. And, and you see that after five years, the Jews were allowed to come back to Rome. So it was like about five years, it was only the Gentiles who were running the entire church. The Gentiles had, the, had, the, um, you know, ha had to run the church because the Jews were all sent out of Rome. And when they came in, you can in imagine the kind of struggle that would have been there between the, the Jews and the Gentiles. And that is where now Paul is coming to. Paul is now coming to that, and that is the topic for us today. Paul is showing them why the gospel and the gospel alone has the power to create oneness. Power to kind of bring in allies, you know, together. Bring in enemies together in unity. Paul illustrates that the gospel and the gospel alone has that, uh, that um, 
power to kind of bring those two. And it's based on a new era, a new humanity. It is not normal. Yesterday I was talking about the biblical worldview and the world, worldly worldview. You know, it is very difficult, like, you know, for an enemies to come together and, and, and just gel together. As you know, Jews were very strict about their traditions. They will not mingle so easily with the other members or the other community, even the Gentiles. But this was the, this was the situation there. And Paul, knowing this, he talks to the, to the church in Rome. And that's when he says in verse 5 and 6, or um, yeah, just the first six verses, and it says like verse 6, including you who are called to belong to Jesus. Dear Gentiles, dear Jews, each of you have been called to belong to Christ Jesus. That's the topic for us today. And I'm, hope that, I'm hoping that this is the reason why Paul clearly talks about including, you know, everyone. Like if you read, uh, if I read the verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, which means among Gentiles, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. So he tries to kind of really say that the power of the gospel is so big that it can bring people together. And I want to kind of really uh, touch upon uh, two things today. You know, you know if, if I have to kind of summarize the the sermon today, we have two things from this verse. The universality of the gospel. You know, gospel is for all. The universality of gospel. Gospel is not just for us alone. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for one particular group of people. But it is, it is to kind of really for every person here. I know I'm kind of stepping into a few um, you know, the sermons of the upcoming days, but I have to do that today. I want to kind of go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Let me read for you that verse. For I am not ashamed, Romans 1, 16. If you, if you, if you can remember this, this is wonderful. For I am not ashamed, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I would like to kind of underline the word everyone. And everyone who believes to the first Jew, Jew, to the Jew first and also to the Greek and this keeps going on. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Are you being reminded of Martin Luther's, you know, um, the, 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 the crux of it, he talks about that same thing, justification by faith. And that's the same thing that, you know, uh, we read here. Gospel is not so uh, uh, an easy thing. We come sometimes take it for granted. Gospel is supposed to be such a powerful tool to bring people together. And I think today we, we are looking at the power of the gospel. Gospel is not just, you know, that we are just, you know, uh, looking forward to God and, and, and doing so many things for God. No. Gospel is God coming to man. That is one uniqueness of our Christian faith. It is not that man had to kind of go in search of God. No. God came in search of man. God came in search of man. In Romans 1.6, Paul emphasizes that the, 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 the gospel is for everyone. Gospel is for everyone, not to a one particular group of people. So the message of salvation is not just limited by race, not limited by doctrine, not limited by, you know, our, um, our uh, denomination, not limited by caste or color. No, it is not limited at all. As Christians, we are called to spread the gospel. The one thing, of course, the universality of the gospel, it's, it's such profound. And Paul brings that in the book of Romans. I'm proud of our church, which has been also 
you know, putting this into practice. We take our gospel to various other communities of people, and we are not limiting it to us alone. When we look at the outreach work that we are doing in our church, it's such a blessing to kind of know that our church has been called to minister to a different group and different crowd and not limiting it to a one particular group. And I would encourage us, even in our personal lives, let's not limit the power of the gospel. It can unite people. It can bring people together. It can kind of really not be limited to just one particular group or race. If there is a way by which you could just share the gospel to whoever God has been entrusting you to, please do so. Please obey the call of God. The second one is the importance of inclusion. And it's the same thing where I'm kind of trying to talk about the inclusiveness in our attitudes. In calling people Gentiles, like, you know, Paul highlights the importance of including diverse people. And you can see the, 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 the picture here is like gospel for all, all nations, diverse. And I think we need to have that not just in our practice, but even in our mind, in our attitude, we might need to have that understanding of inclusiveness. Again, I'm kind of proud of the church where we had inclusive community. And we need to kind of really grow in that, but of course, we have been making good progress. We have a separate service for the Santosh Nagar people that shows that we are inclusive and there's more scope for us to do so. And let's not really limit ourselves. Let's, not, let's make sure that we have inclusion right from our attitude, right from our mind. And I would, I would request you to not be just caught up with, with just the gospel that, or like, like the Jews where they kind of really said that this is only for us. It is for every person in the world. And that is the desire that Christ laid his life. And for not just for us, not just for Egmore Wesley Church, or not just for the people in Chennai, not just for the Christian community, but Christ laid down his life for every sinner in this world. Paul clearly says that none of us have been righteous. All have fallen short in the glory of God. All, everyone, you can say, I mean, you can't say that like, I've been leading a good life. No, God expects us to be perfect, but nobody is perfect. And that's where Christ can really work in us. And today I want to kind of remind ourselves once again that if there is a way by which we could, we could just extend the power of the gospel to others, that would be a wonderful thing to do. Not just limiting to our own self. Have, a, have an intention of inclusivity. Inclusion is very, very important. Every person, every nation, let them know the power of gospel in and through us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Help us not to limit the power of gospel, Lord. Lord, thank you that Paul had been working with the Jews and the Gentiles in the Romans church. And Lord, we just thank you that it's not just for them, but it also applies for us today. Help us not to limit the gospel, but Lord, to spread the gospel to every nation, to every people whom we meet. It could be a simple person who is helping us. And Lord, help us to kind of overcome all the fears and struggles that we might have I pray that, Lord, that we will, we will always be attentive, sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that, Lord, the Holy Spirit will continue to push us, Lord, stretch us to our maximum potential to preach the word to people who are around us. We thank you for this day. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.